In our last two lectures on the second part of the Faust by Goethe and on Walden by Henry David Thoreau, we have explored two themes that I believe every thoughtful individual must come to terms with, the ideal of beauty and the ideal of nature. Are there absolute standards for beauty? Can we step back, as Socrates said, and say that in heaven there exists perfection of beauty, and all else on earth is but a reflection of it? And then are there absolute standards based upon that ideal of beauty by which we judge works of art? And can we then teach these ideal values to students? Well, the answer of the Athenian democracy was yes. They believed that the Greek temple could achieve perfection within the limits it set for itself, and the Athenian democracy set out to build the Parthenon and to make it perfection. We as a democracy say no. We do not believe that there are absolute standards, and we accept ugliness that would have appalled an Athenian. Highways of American cities, as we mentioned in our last lecture, are an enduring testimony to our acceptance of ugly. Thoreau brings to our mind the concept of nature. And for Thoreau, as I believe it should be, nature is the great source of renewal for the thoughtful individual. And the society that is a truly thoughtful society will do all possible to preserve not just that natural beauty, but to engage itself with the natural rhythm that is part of that beauty. Third topic that every individual must deal with is history, pa the past. What is our relationship to the past and does it have any meaning for us today? The great work that we began with, the Iliad, is all about preserving the past. It is telling the Greeks of 800 B.C. about their great past with warriors like Agamemnon and Achilles. The past, Confucius believed that it was one of his most important tasks to teach his students about antiquity. Our own age, you can ponder this with me, is essentially, in my view, ahistorical. A lot of history works are published, a lot of biographies are published, but we lack that criterion for studying the past and relating ourselves to the past that the age of the Enlightenment, the age of the founders of our country called, a philosophical view of history. That means that history is viewed as a means for understanding the present and looking into the future. The founders of our country were profoundly influenced by the past. They studied classical antiquity as they forged the Declaration of Independence, as they forged the Constitution, to provide models of how Republican and Democratic governments had worked in the past. And they believed that history was a tool and that no society was immune to the process of historical decay. Every nation would pass away. And now when I ask students that, only two or three will raise their hand out of a class of 400. If I say, will America ever pass away? Will one day some professor be standing to a group of students far, far away in another galaxy talking about the Americans, perhaps devoting two whole lectures to them? And at the end, a student will come up and say, are the Americans going to be on the test? Are they really that important? No one would accept that. None of my class really admits that. And so the Romans of the second century A.D. believed that they were eternal. And that is what the emperors told them. We are eternal. Eternitas. It's a symbol of Rome. The Roman Empire will never pass away. But of course it did. And for the age of the Enlightenment, for the 18th century, for figures like Goethe, for the founders of our own country, and for Edward Gibbon, the story of how and why the grandeur of the Roman Empire passed away was of compelling importance. And Edward Gibbon wrote the greatest single work 
in English of history ever composed, I would suggest to you that it ranks right along with Thucydides, Herodotus, Livy, and Gibbon's own great model, Tacitus, as one of the five greatest histories ever composed, his history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, a work significantly enough that was composed and published between 1776 and 1789, the very period in which the American Declaration of Independence, the War of Independence, and the Constitution were being forged. And Gibbon, for part of that period, sat as a member of Parliament. And as he said, I watched every issue of the day, all of them centering around the great question, the independence of the American colonies. And my time in Parliament, Gibbon said, was a school of civic virtue, of patriotism, the first quality a historian needs. And like the founders of our country, indeed even like the Tories who were fighting against them, the central theme was liberty. And Gibbon's great history is a long and sad commentary on the history of a nation that gave up political liberty to be a superpower. For that is what the Romans did. Under their Republican Constitution, which our founders so admired, and which Gibbon described in brilliant sentences, under that Republican Constitution, with a balance between the Senate and the people, with a strong executive commander-in-chief, the Romans rose from being a tiny city-state by the Tiber River to be masters of their world. And by the first century B.C., they were absolute masters of their world. But that empire that they had won, that multicultural, diverse empire, poured enormous wealth and affluence into Rome, and it corrupted every aspect of their republican political system, so that elections were openly bought and sold for vast campaign contributions. Political factions became so strong and the infighting became so great that the Senate was brought to gridlock. And tiny problems in the Middle East that might could have been solved with rapidity and with benefit for all were allowed to drag on and on with constant changes in policy. Until finally, the Roman people lost all confidence in their government, in their republican way of life. And they, like the provincials they ruled over, wanted just peace and order. So they gave up their political liberty and transferred all real power to a military dictator. Oh, we call him an emperor, but he was and remained throughout the course of the Roman Empire a military dictator. And the first of these was the greatest man who ever lived. We met him, Julius Caesar. Is there anyone like that on our horizon? And then he was followed by the greatest statesman who ever lived, Augustus. And between the two of them, they created a new order that brought peace and prosperity to their world. And this reached its apex in the second century AD when the Roman Empire spanned the North Sea all the way to the Sahara and from the moors of Scotland out to the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys of Iraq. Joined together in common allegiance to Rome with the individual citizen guaranteed rights, peace and prosperity, unequaled again until the 20th century. And that is where Gibbon begins his discussion of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Is the Roman Empire in the age of the Antonines? He came to his work uh, from a very well-off childhood. He uh, was born to a father that had a lot of money and a grandfather who had made that money in the uh, cloth uh, and the wool business, cloth and wool business. He had gone to Oxford for a short time, but he had found Oxford most uninspiring. He said, I went the first day to my tutor, and we read a little bit of Terence, and uh, he listened quietly. Came back the next day, I wasn't very well prepared. He listened quietly, said nothing. Came back the third day, was very badly prepared, said nothing, smiled as I left. Missed the fourth day and wrote him a little note. He thanked me politely. Missed the fifth day and didn't write him anything. He didn't care, so I never came back. 
Instead, he spent his time rummaging around in the bookstores of Oxford. In fact, he said, if I had spent my time among the monks of Oxford, steeped in the port the way they were, I never would have written The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Like Winston Churchill, or like Polybius, he was not an academic historian. But what he did do as a youth rummaging there in the uh, bookstores of Oxford is meet a Catholic at a time when Catholics were not allowed to go to Oxford and where there were heavy civil disabilities for being a Catholic, and he converted. And he went home on spring break and said, Dad, guess what I've done? I've become a Catholic. His father was outraged, shipped him off to Switzerland, put him under the tutelage of a Protestant minister with a very unclean wife, slatternly is the way that Gibbon described her, who set a very dirty table for him. But the minister brought him back into shape, and he converted nominally back to Protestantism and the Church of England. But mainly, he learned Greek and Latin really well this time around, developed a great love for history, and learned French so well that he always thought in French after that. Then he came back to England, served for a brief time in the Hampshire militia, the time when it th was thought the French were going to invade England. And he said, you know, those few months in the Hampshire militia were not insignificant to the historian of the Roman Empire because I learned about military tactics and what it was like to be a soldier. Then he traveled in Europe, and he'd already decided that he wanted to make a great name for himself by writing a history. And he searched for a theme, and he was engrossed by the concept of liberty. He thought about writing a history of the Florentine Republic, spurred on by Machiavelli. He thought about writing a history of the brave little cantons of Switzerland. But in Rome, in October of 1764, Gibbon was sitting on the Capitoline Hill where the great temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the guardian of the Roman Republic and Empire, had once been. And he was sitting on the steps of what was now the temple of uh, the church of Santa Maria in Araceli. And he was looking out over the forum. And the forum in those days was called the cow pasture because it was nothing but a grown-up field with a few columns poking up. There where Cicero had once been, cows and sheep pastured and a few people lived in torn down, crumbling ruins. And he was pondering, why had all the grandeur of Rome passed away? And then these monks came down the steps, barefoot, their hoods over their faces, chanting their evening prayers. And Gibbon decided right then, I would write a great history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and why the grandeur of that great nation collapsed before barbarism, and these are his words, and superstition. Why Christian monks and German barbarians came to rule Rome. And so that became his task. He began to prepare himself by wide and voluminous reading, and I'll tell you this right now. You can sit down with Gibbon and read him and learn as many facts that are as accurate about the Roman Empire as you can read in a book published right now. And he went beyond many of the historians of the next century, the 19th century, in the careful use he made of archaeological evidence, of the use of coins, the use of art, and in his broad vision of the culture of the empire as being just as important as the political history, and in his broad vision of what the Roman Empire was. So. His treatment of the Middle East, his treatment of Muhammad is superb and very, very fair-minded. In fact, to many of his critics, it was much more fair-minded than his treatment of Christianity, which got him into big hot water. And he made a lot of people mad at him about his treatment of Christianity because he professed just to go through and look at it as a historical phenomenon and ask whether these miracles really occurred and like this. So he had a broad vision superb knowledge of the sources, and what he had was a magnificent English style. Oh, if you want to learn English prose the way it should be written, read Gibbon. I'll tell you someone who did. It was Winston Churchill. Churchill believed that most great books were wasted on young people. And probably, if you read too many books, it was a bad thing. So he read a few books very, very carefully. And when he was a lieutenant in India, he had his mother send him the complete set of Gibbon, and there, he said, I learned to write.
There I gained that mastery of the English language that would stand me in such good stead when I was in Parliament. There he learned those rolling phrases that would rally a nation, that would never surrender and never give up. So I want to read you just a bit of Gibbon because I think it is a monument of English prose. And let's just see how he begins his work because it is not without interest and relevance for us today. In the second century of the Christian era, era the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. The frontiers of that extensive monarchy were guarded by ancient renown and disciplined valor. Notice his use of commas. Notice his use of adjectives. Ancient renown, disciplined valor. You can hear Churchill speaking. The gentle but powerful, ah, look the contrast there, the gentle but powerful influence of laws and manners had gradually cemented the union of the provinces. Their peaceful inhabitants enjoyed and abused the advantages of wealth and luxury. The image of a free constitution was preserved with decent reverence. The Roman Senate appeared to possess the sovereign authority and devolved on, all, on the emperors all the executive powers of government. Ah, that had been part of the mastery of Augustus to leave the old constitution standing as a facade while gathering all real power into his hands because people, as given understood, want prosperity and peace and they care nothing about liberty as long as they have jobs and are prosperous. Or as the emperors understood, bread and circuses, plenty to eat, good incomes, and good entertainment. But in today's word, Lots of affluence and cable TV. That is all people wanted, and the empress gave it to them. During a happy period from A.D. 98 to 180, of more than fourscore years, the public administration was conducted by the virtue and abilities. Given will never use one word when two can be got in, three even better, of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the two Antonines. It is the design of this and of the two succeeding chapters to describe the prosperous condition of their empire and afterwards from the death of Marcus Antonius to deduce the most important circumstances of its decline and fall, a revolution which will ever be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. So in that first paragraph, not only told you what he's going to write about, but he has left you with a profound sense of how important this historical event is. For it was the death of the ancient world and the birth of modern Europe. The great nations of Gibbon's own day, England, the land of the Angles and Saxons, France, Frankreich, the land of the Franks, Germany, these had all been born in the collapse of the Roman Empire. And these great Teutonic nations, Franks, other Germanic tribes, the Angles and Saxons, had all taken the place of the Romans. And Gibbon will refer to how this race of giants, as he called the Teutons, burst upon the scene and pulled down the small pygmies that the Romans had become. And after a series of centuries, he says, and these are his words, not mine, restored a manly spirit of freedom and laid the foundation for the progress of our own age. For Gibbon was convinced that history is a story of progress. There will be fits and starts, but ultimately we in the age of the Enlightenment, the age of the 18th century, have moved far beyond in terms of our technology. And do you know one of the greatest signs he saw of progress was America. And he said, you know, if there ever were another barbarian flood to break out upon us from some nations we no longer take seriously, why, the progress of Europe would continue in America, already peopled with Europeans, where the language and literature and culture of Europe continues to flourish. Because it was interesting. 
that during all the debates on the American Revolution, Gibbon never said a word. And the example of both the good or orators and the bad ones prevented me. But I was an attentive listener, he said. However, you have to live, now do you not? Now, this is why I like Gibbon so much, a short, portly man, balding early. And he liked good port, liked, liked to buy books, liked to live well, and um, writing French very well. He was given the chance by the government of Lord North, the prime minister during the revolution, to write a paper that would justify British policy to Europe. And it needed to be written in French, the language of diplomacy. And he wrote a masterful example of it. And it did well, it did. It, it conveyed the English position extremely well. And uh, then he was offered a sinecure to sit on the board of trade, which never met, but paid a handsome salary. And so he always, when called upon to vote, voted on the side of Lord North. But in his letters, it made it clear that England was making a grievous mistake. And from time to time, obliquely, in the pages of his history, he will say what England really needs to be done. And as the Roman Empire is in its great period of decline in the 5th century, Gibbon says, if only the emperors had had the sense to establish provincial assemblies in each one of their provinces, allowed the provincials to elect their representatives to those provincial assemblies, given them complete control over their internal affairs, including their taxation, why the Roman Empire would have endured forever, supported by the loyal arms of free men. So that's what England really should do. But now is there anything wrong with his voting with, for Lord North? Absolutely not, because it gave him the quality of port, the quality of roast beef to write these immortal pages. In 1776, the first volume came out, and it was a runaway bestseller. I awoke to find myself famous, Gibbon said. My book was on every coffee table and in almost every toilet in England. It was a masterpiece and immediately recognized as such. It went through a series of official editions, and there were a number of pirated editions. And Gibbon now became independently wealthy. And when Lord North's government collapsed and he lost his position on the Board of Trade, he retired to Lausanne in Switzerland and there wrote his final volumes, finishing on a June night when he took a walk around his villa, looked out over the calm sea and said with considerable regret, I had taken leave of a friend that had been with me all those years, that wonderful story of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But I could also say that I had made myself famous, and that's what I set out to do. And so he did make himself famous. He would go on to write an autobiography, which is one of the most charming and interesting autobiographies in English. In it, he refers to why he decided to write the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And he ends up with some message maybe for all of us. As you eat, reach the end of your life, and that will come, even to you, you reach the end of your life, you can perhaps take, if you're an enthusiast, as he called them, take some consol consol uh, consolation in going to heaven, if you believe that. Or if you don't, you can say, well, at least I've got these children and they'll carry on if, you, if they're really worthwhile. Or you can say, I set out to do something really great and I did it. And believe me, that's the best feeling in the world. And in his history still speaks to us today. Because Gibbon saw in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire eternal lessons. And I want to draw one of those lessons for us right now. I believe that the Roman Empire, this vast, militarily powerful and prosperous nation, was the only superpower in history until the United States. I want to define superpower for you carefully. It is a nation that is absolutely dominant militarily, politically, economically, and culturally. And Rome was in its world, and we are in ours. And like Rome, our culture is derivative. Rome was the bearer of Greek civilization. The Roman emperors were all bilingual, speaking Greek as well as Latin. 
Greek was the uh, official language of the empire along with Latin. And the Roman emperors believed that Greek culture, the values of Plato, the literature of Sophocles, these provided the common cultural cement of their empire. It was the tolerant and multicultural empire in which the Romans built temples to the gods of Egypt, to the gods of the Celts. You could plead your case in court in Celtic or in Syriac, but the Roman emperors also believed there must be a common culture, and they found that in Greece. Well, we are the bearers of European culture. Now, many nations have added to the richness of America, but the language we speak is European. The alphabet we write in is European, and the basis of our whole school system is European. It's very ideals. So we are the bearers of European civilization. And like the Romans, we are one of only two superpowers that have ever existed. And in the pages of Gibbon, we find why Rome declined and fell. It fell because of its involvement in the Middle East and its failure to solve the problem of the Middle East. And Gibbon describes the Middle East in the time of the 3rd century A.D. when Iran, the great eastern power that was the only possible count counterbalance to Rome, underwent a tremendous religious revival of religious fundamentalism. 800 years before the prophet Zarathustra had proclaimed his religion centered around the Lord of Truth, in constant struggle with the lie, in the same way that Muhammad would later proclaim God to be the Lord of truth, in constant struggle with the lie. He proclaimed, Zarathustra did, a religion of ethical righteousness in which you made your decision, and if you chose the Lord of truth and fought for the Lord of truth and spread his religion by fire and sword, you went to paradise. And if you lied and said the Lord of truth was not, then you passed into eternal hell and revitalized by that grand, powerful religious fundamentalism, the Iranians swept out of the desert lands and into the borders of the Roman Empire. So much so that a Roman emperor was taken captive, carried off to Iran, flayed alive, and his skin hung up in the temple of the Lord of Truth of Ahura Mazda. And from that devastation of the 3rd century A.D., Rome would never recover. Oh, there'd be fits and starts back, but Rome was broken from that moment because the Middle East had come to absorb all the attention of the Romans. Going all the way back to the annexation of Judea, Rome had found itself involved for three centuries in trying to nation-build in the Middle East, in pouring vast amounts of wealth into the Middle East, keeping large numbers of troops there that only alienated the people of the Middle East. So that civil war, expenses, the loss of manpower was a constant drain upon the Romans, but more than that, it distracted them from other dangers. And above all, the focus upon the Middle East made the Romans underestimate the dangers in Central Europe same area today that we would call Poland and the Soviet Union, the eastern part of Germany. And they underestimated the growing power of the Germanic barbarians along their Danube and Rhine River frontiers. And in coordination then with Iran, those northern barbarians would crash through the Roman frontiers in the third century, ravaging and plundering. So the failure of the Romans to solve the problem of the Middle East, once they had become involved there, provided the military, the political, and the economic source of their collapse. It even completely disrupted the politics of Rome because the constant war with the East, with the Iranians, led to the collapse of the ordered government of the age of the first and second centuries A.D. And Rome would emerge from this, a bureaucratic totalitarian state, still incapable of solving the problem of the Middle East. So in the pages of Gibbon, we read the story of one more empire that found its graveyard 
in the Middle East. So Gibbon speaks with very profound relevance to us as Americans in this 21st century.